I sure appreciate them. You know, Pastor Bob's the leader of our, our section. Is it called a section or a region or something like that? And I appreciate uh, their leadership in our section. And, and, um, and I'm glad that you guys are able to go on sabbatical. You know, how many know that we need to do that from time to time? You know, we need to take time away to just rest and get refreshed. And I know I did a sabbatical after about seven years of ministry in South Dakota. And, and it was so helpful to my wife and I. And, uh, you know, um, it's good to, good to do that. I was going to say, Pastor Bob, and I've been up to Lodi going on well, five, almost six years. And so maybe you could email Pastor Brian and say, you know, you should send Pastor Barb to get me on a sabbatical. <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, you do, you, 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 you're you facing the, the, the things in a community, you know, there are spiritual strongholds, and there's pressures, and there's things that come at you, especially at the leader of, of, a, of a group of people, and, 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 you know, you're trying to make headway into the community, and, and see the promises of God fulfilled, and, and there's resistance to that, and it can get weary, you know. And uh, we need time to just step back and get refreshed and get refocused, and and uh, and God is so good. God is so good. It's actually a biblical principle, isn't it? You know, we should take a day off every seven days, right? That's right. Amen. And uh, so rest is a part of God's plan for us here on this earth. So, well, today uh, we're going to delve back into a story found in the Old Testament. You know, the stories in the Old Testament were recorded to give us examples, right? Examples that we can learn from. And the title of my message this morning is Loose Lips Sink Ships. Loose Lips Sink Ships. And this is one of those kind of messages that's good for us to hear from time to time. I mean, there are certain messages in Scripture that we need to continually be reminded of. And we need to, you know, we, we should put them in our, in, on our calendar, you know, to preach on them every once in a while. Well, this is one of those kind of messages. It's, it's a kind of message we need to be reminded of on a, on a regular basis. And if you've got your Bibles, just hold up, hold up your sword. This is the sword of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word, that it is sharp and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a thought and discerner of the intents of our heart, Lord. So we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning, what your spirit would have to say to us from your word. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's so pure, it's so holy, it's so righteous and true. And we want your truth embedded into the core of our hearts and our lives so that we might live by your word and stand on your word, Lord Jesus. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And Lord, you've given the church your word. The living word, the logos word, the rhema word. We need it, Lord, for our lives and for our health and our being. So feed us today the food yes. from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now turn to me, turn with me to uh, Numbers 13. Numbers chapter 13. It's a passage of scripture that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's about the 12 spies. How many of you ever heard the story about how the 12 spies went into the promised land to, to spy it out? Well, let me cover a little of background before we read the story to sort of put this passage of Scripture into context. All right, approximately a year and a half has transpired since the children of Israel left Egypt. They had spent at that time in the desert, and where they saw time after time the powerful hand of God leading and guiding and providing and protecting them. Right, And they, are, they were camped at Mount Sinai for about a year, a little over a year, and it was there that Moses received the Ten Commandments, right? And he received all the customary laws and the feasts and the celebrations and, and along with the instructions for building the tabernacle. And it was all laid out for them there at Mount Sinai. And according to Deuteronomy 1, God had spoken to them and said, you have been at Mount Sinai long enough. It says specifically that it was an 11 day journey up to Kadesh Barnea. Say that, Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea. That, that's important, all right? Which was at the southern end of the promised land. 
So, so they're now camped there at Kadesh Barnea, according to our passage of Scripture. And the Lord's going to speak to Moses to send 12 spies into the land. And they were sent into the land to see what God had prepared for them. I want to say that again. They were sent into the land to see what God had prepared for them. How many know God has prepared some things for you? God has prepared some things for your church. Amen? And they were to go in there and see what God had prepared for them. At this point, they had been out of Egypt for just shy of two years. Hey, really, they were moving along pretty good. I mean, they had their snags, right? They, 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 they ran into a few problems here and there, and some issues came up. But they were right on schedule. Think about it, moving two million plus slaves from total bondage to freedom and becoming a nation in two years. Only God could do that. I mean, only God could do that. But, but things were about to change. And we'll see from the 13th chapter of Numbers. We'll see that. Now let's, let's just sort of spot read down through this passage and get an idea of what was going on. Verse 1 says, the Lord's given them some instructions. He says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel, or which I am giving to the children of Israel. For each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran. Now following is a list of, of each man that was chosen, 12 men men from each tribe. Verse 6, it talks about Caleb. A little later, it talks about Joshua being one of them. And then in verse 17, Moses gives the 12 men instructions. They had been set apart. They had been consecrated and told that they were to go spy out the land that the Lord was going to give them. So Moses gives them some specific instructions, kind of like a, a homework assignment, if you would. Verse 17 says, then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. So there's your assignment right there. That is what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to go in and explore the land, scout it out, investigate, survey, and bring back some fruit. Verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rahab. And it goes on and it tells every place that they went and what they saw. Now, verse 23 tells us about the huge cluster of grapes they found. I mean, it took two men to carry that cluster of grapes on a pole. Think about that. Now, that is a cluster of grapes. And they got some pomegranates and figs. And then verse 25 tells us that it took them 40 days to do that. 40 days. So they, they came back and they reported to Moses and the congregation everything that they saw and showed them the fruit. Then in verse 27 it says, Then they told them and said, We went to the land where you sent us, and truly, oh man, things are going good, truly it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They show them the fruit, right? And then verse 28, Nevertheless, uh-oh, that's the first bad sign right there. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. In other words, we saw the giants there. In verse 29, they, they, they tell Moses where each of the nations live. And so far, they're doing everything that God told them to do, that Moses told them to do. Now, let's get the picture of what's going on. Moses has heard from God. Spend, send out some spies into the land that I'm going to give you. That was the assignment. So Moses selects some men from each tribe. They were all leaders, all right? Very wise men. I mean, they were smart men. I mean, they didn't get chosen for being slouches. They were the cream of the crop. That's why they were in the positions of leadership that they were in, right? Smart men. I mean, they didn't, and, and, and 
They sent them into the land. All right, he sent them into the land. Moses tells them what to look for. Take a look at the cities, take a look at the people, take a look at the crops, and take a look at the whole land and see what it's like. And they did that. They spent 40 days doing that, fulfilling that assignment. They came back and they reported to Moses. They had done everything they were asked to do up to that point, except for that little nevertheless word, you know, in verse 28, right? But look at what happens when they get down to verse 30. It says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Amen. Are you a Caleb? Are you a Joshua? Verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone has spies. um, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and and, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in theirs. It says in verse 32 that they gave a bad report. And if you were to look over into the next chapter, in, in chapter 14, verse 36, it again says they said they gave a bad report. And if you look at the next verse in 37, it says that it was an evil report. So hold on a minute. Let's just pause and look at this for a minute. What's going on here? They did exactly what Moses told them to do, right? Or did they? Let's think it through. They were told to go up and come back, report what they saw. Go up, take a look. Take a look at the people, what they're like. Take a look at the city, see what they're like. Cities, what what, what they're like. See what the produce is like. See what kinds of place it is. Search it out from north, south, east, and west. And they did. For 40 days, they did. They came back to Moses. Yup, it's a great land. Showed them the fruit. Showed them the prudos. It sure does. It flows with milk and honey. Here are some of the grapes. Took two men to carry them things on a pole. Here are the pomegranates. They have fortified cities up there. And and they're really big people up there. They did exactly what they were told to do. And yet, three times we're told that they gave a bad report. Now, how could have it been a bad report? If they had done everything they were asked to do. Well, here's where I think they went astray. They were asked to go up and spy out the land and report what they saw. They were not asked to form an opinion about the land and what they saw. Let me say that again. They were asked to go up and take a look at the land that God was going to give them. That God had promised to them. It was the promised land, right? And report what they saw. They were not asked to go up, take a look, and draw a conclusion from what they saw. You know, if they could take the land or not. They were only supposed to go up and take a look at what God was going to give them. But don't we do that sometimes? The point is this. Many times we function off of our own conclusions instead of the promises of God. We look at a situation and we decide whether we think we can do it or not. We, we look at a person maybe that we're working with or ministering with. We decide whether they can make it or not. Or whether they can get saved or not. Uh, we look at the nation and we think, we decide whether it can turn or not. We look at a community and we decide whether it can be reached or not. We look at the promises of God and decide whether we can really see them come to pass or not. And we draw a conclusion. We speak our own conclusions instead of speaking the promises of God. Amen. How many know that our words are powerful? There is death and there is life in the tongue, the power of the tongue. And this is exactly what I believe is going on here. This brings us to the title of the message, Loose Lips Sink Ships. Now, do you realize that the army of Israel 
it says it was numbered at 603,550. Now this number did not include those that were too young and too old to fight, nor did it include the women and children. So conservatively speaking, you know, there are different numbers that commentators throw around, but conservatively speaking, we're talking about a million and a half to two million people. And ten guys sunk the ship. Think about it. Ten guys sunk the ship for a million to a to a million and a half to two million people because they didn't come back and say, here is what we saw. But they came back and totally ignored what God had said and that he was going to give them the land. But they formed an opinion and they shared their opinion about what they saw and what they perceived. And that opinion sunk the ship for up to two million people. Wow. When you sit and think about that, that's sad. These ten men spread unbelief and despair and discouragement to the entire congregation simply through what they spoke, through the words that came out of their mouth. They shared their own assessment of the situation. Now, these stories are in the Bible for our learning. God's given us examples Examples, good examples to follow, examples that didn't turn out so good so we can learn from them and avoid those same mistakes, amen? So God said, I'm going to give you that land. Just go up and walk through it and see what I'm going to give you. Come back and report what you see. Don't come back and form an opinion about what you see. But they came back and sunk the ship for a million to a million and a, to two million people. That is so amazing to me that a few could sidetrack so many. A few kept so many from enjoying God's fulfilling, fulfilled promise. A few loose lips sunk the ship for an entire generation of people. Does anyone know where the, that phrase came, came, comes from, loose lips sink ships? Anyone got an idea? Well, during the war, I think it was World War II, spies would hang around the waterfront, and they'd go into the bars, and they'd just, they would just sit and listen. They would just tune their ears into the conversations of the soldiers and the, and the sailors. And, and they just listen and they take note of what the guys were saying. And they would hear one guy say, yeah, I think we're going to be leaving tomorrow. We're sailing out tomorrow. And they, they'd hear another guy say, yeah, this, this is where we're going. And, and all very casual comments in conversation. But they would put them all together. And they would find the sailing, find out what the sailing times were and the desti destinations of the ships. And they would relay that information out to the wolf packs, the German submarines that were hanging off the coast in the Atlantic. And they would sink the ships. That's where that phrase came from. Loose lips sink ships. And ten of them, two of them said, come on, we can do it. God's with us. Let's go. Right? But ten of them said, nope. Ten against two. We outrank you. We can't do it. We've got this opinion here. We just read it right there. It says, there's no way we can take on the inhabitants of that land. They're too big. This is our perspective. So we can't do it. But God didn't ask them to consider the question. He didn't ask them to consider whether they could do it or not. All he said was, go up, take a look at what I am going to give you. Ten guys turned a minimum of a million and a half to two million people out into the wilderness for a 38-year death march in the hot wilderness. When all they said had to do was come back and take one step, one step of faith, and they would have been in the promised land. And they would have seen God work on their behalf powerfully and in supernatural ways. How many know that we serve a supernatural God who is able, far above and beyond, to comp our comprehension to do things? Loose lips sink ships. Well, let's apply this 5,000-year-old story to today. You know, we, just like the children of Israel, and all of us at times, Stand at our own Kadesh Barneas, if you would. That's where they were camped, right at the edge of the promised land. And sometimes we stand 
right at the edge of the promises that God has given us. We have all received promises, right? We've received promises through a word from Scripture that God quickened to our hearts. Maybe you received a prophetic word that, that, that was a promise that God gave. Maybe you received a dream. Maybe, maybe you, you took a few days aside and you got before God and you got the vision for the church like Pastor Bob has done. You know, and he confirms it to your heart. We all have promises that God has given us. Hopes and dreams. Something that's more than just an imagination. I'm talking about something that God has really put in our hearts. Individually and corporately. He gives them to us individually. And he gives them to us corporately. The body of Christ that he has in places in different communities. I know I have some promises that he's given me. Right? And we stand at these places, these doorways, if you would, to great blessing. But how many know that there's usually some resistance at those places? There's some satanic opposition, especially when we're about to break into the next level. Especially uh, when we're about to break into the promises of God. There's usually great resistance in these places. Giants, if you would. Fortified cities and strongholds, if you would. And, and we see the resistance, and we feel the resistance, and we look at the resistance, and, and, and it's at this point, it's at that point we have to make a choice. Are we going to believe what God said, or are we going to form our own opinions? Or are we going to listen to the lies that the enemy's whispering in our, hair, in our head? You can't do that. It's too tough. It's too hard. What are we going to listen to? What are we going to listen to? And, and are we going to speak positively into the promises of God? Or speak negatively from our own opinion? Letting our thoughts and our tongues sink the ship. See, words are powerful. A negative word can sink the ship. A negative focus, a negative word, a negative comment can turn the situation can even turn your destiny, can even turn the destiny of other people. Have you ever been in the place where you heard from God and all you want to do is be obedient to God? And you're so excited about it, you share your, the way God laid on your heart with other people. And the majority of the people around you speak nothing but discouragement. They say, ah, what do you think you're doing? You can't do that. That's impossible. You can do that. You can do that. Praise the name of the Lord. We all stand in these Kadesh Barneas from time to time where God has given us a word and we're to step into it. But others say, ah, that'll never work. We tried that back in the 70s and it failed. And this happened and that happened. And I mean, the war stories go on and on. I mean, no one wants to give a victory report. But what's the point? We have to be careful what we say, and what we listen to. You and I have to be careful what we speak and what we listen to. We must be careful we don't let others sink our ship. We must be careful that we don't sink our own ship with our own words. And we must also be careful we don't sink someone else's ship with our words. Amen? Are you following me? When, when, when you speak... Are your words building up or tearing down? That's a good question to ask. Are your words building up or are they tearing down? Now, this is what we should say to people. If God's given you a promise, if he's spoken something into your heart, then go for it. Go for it. He's going to be there with his provision. He's got, we've got more angels with us than the enemy has demons with him. Amen. He's got more resources. He's the God of all supply. You can do it because he'll work on your behalf. He'll work with you and for you. And you're going to be able to see that thing come to pass. Go for it. That's the kind of report we need to be giving the people. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not saying this is a problem here. You know, I heard a pastor once say, I would rather preach on something that's not a problem before it becomes ever a problem than to have to preach on the problem when it is a problem. Right. Amen? And so this is an encouragement. 
This is really a message we need to hear on a regular basis. Because we've got to be careful what we speak and what we share. And to be positive and not negative. Because there are promises God has given each of you. And those promises are there. And you might be standing at that Kadesh Barnea right now. And you're feeling some resistance. But I'm here to encourage you. You go for it. God's with you. You take that step of faith. And you're going to see God work on your behalf. Now based on everything that we have just looked at. There are a few things we can glean from this passage of scripture. Six to be precise. So I don't know what time you usually get out. Just settle back. And we're going to preach on this entire message. Actually, each point is pretty short, so don't worry. It's not a two hours from now we'll be done, right? So number one, we need to be careful who we listen to when we set out to check out what God's given to us. We need to be careful who we listen to. We need to be careful. If we're getting bad counsel, get away from it. If we're getting negativity, get away from it. Turn it off. Turn to something that's going to be being positive, and building you up, and encouraging you, and edifying you. And I'm telling you, that first and foremost comes from the Word of God, and meditating on the promises, and God's ability. And then it also comes from getting around people that are going to speak life into you. And then, if it's our own words, hey, stop that. Just stop. If you sense negativity starting to come out of your own mouth, stop not going to be good, right? Start speaking life over every circumstance and situation. You know, I, I like uh, Gregory Dickow. He's a, he's a pastor down in Chicago. He has some neat material, and it's called the 40-day fast from wrong thinking. The 40-day fast from wrong thinking. And because how many know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Out of our thoughts, it eventually comes out. And so, he, if, if you were to, to, to Google that, 40 Day Fast from Wrong Thinking, Gregory Dickow, you'll be led to a website where you can sign up for an email that he'll shoot for the next 40 days. Every day, he'll send a little short devotional email that gives you a thought for that day to fast from and to put replace with God's Word. It's, it's powerful if you do it, and I would encourage you to. So, point number two we need to keep in mind what he can do, not what we can do. Do you think that God was surprised when that they had giants in the land? Of course not. I mean, do you think God was surprised that they had fortified cities? I mean, when they got in there and saw all that stuff, did God say, oh, oh no, I, I didn't see that before. I'm so sorry. Uh, we're not going to be able to do this. God already knew about it when he said to them, go take a look what I'm going to give you. Maybe God was testing them. Get this. Maybe God was testing them to see what they, how they would respond. What they would begin to speak when they saw the strongholds. When they saw and ran into the giants. He might have said, all right, I want you to go up and check out this land, you, you, you people. And, and I, I want to sit back and see how you're going to respond to this. Are you ready to receive these promises? I think maybe, maybe that's what God was doing. And what if they had said, all ten of them, all twelve of them, said, oh man, there's some big guys up there, there's some fortresses, some strongholds, but God is with us, look at what he's already done, we can do it, let's go, let's go, let's go, get ready, come on Moses, we're excited, it's a good land, we're going to eat some big grapes, woo! I mean, what, what? We would be reading a different story today if they hadn't done that. You know, there's some stories that are being in the process of being written right now in your lives. I hope you do that instead of what those ten, ten, ten guys did. Do what Caleb and Joshua did, right? We need to keep in mind what he can do, not what we can do. He said he was going to do it. He didn't say go up and see if there's potential that you somehow can go up and secure this thing for yourself. He said, I'm going to give it to you. I mean, God proved that to them, albeit 40 years later, to the next generation, right? When they came to their first challenge, the walls of Jericho, stronghold, fortified city. And what did God do? 
He just had them be obedient, walk around the city seven times, seven days or whatever it was, you know. They came down, gave him the city, just like that. God will prove himself faithfully. Number three, we need to keep in mind that our self-perception can many times lead to self-deception. If you've got yourself in the center of the mix and you're focused on yourself and what you think you can do and what you think you can't do, that's going to lead to self-deception. They called themselves grasshoppers. <laughs> I mean, they looked at them and said, oh my, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. I like what T.D. Jakes says about this. He says, grasshoppers don't eat grapes. <laughs> in other words... If you're going to perceive yourself this way, you're not going to enjoy the benefits of Almighty God. We need to perceive ourselves for who we really are. We're, we're children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is all those Jehovahs, our healer, our supplier. He meets all our needs according to His riches and glory. And he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Are you with me? You start meditating on who God is, all of a sudden, you start coming up to who you really are in Him. Are you that in yourself? No. That's what we got to die to ourselves. We got to follow Jesus and let Him be who He is through us. And that happens as we turn our focus. We start to speak and declare what God's Word and His promises are speaking and declaring. These were children of God. These were people that he delivered from Egypt. These were people that, that he opened the Red Sea for. These were people he destroyed an entire army before their very eyes that were out to get them. I mean, that army wasn't going to just, you know, they were going to kill them. They were going to destroy them. But God destroyed the army in there in front of them. Did they have to do anything? No. Moses just had to be obedient and lift his stick. And the people just had to be obedient and step in there with a the wall here and a the wall there. And they walked through. They were just obedient. God worked on their behalf. These were people that he had given the Ten Commandments to, and the tabernacle, and the manna, and the water from a rock, and meat, and everything, cloud by day, fire by night. And now they're worried about a giant, a fortified city, ten guys, with their perception and their words, sunk the ship, literally sunk the ship, took the life of over a million people, two million people. I did the math, all right? Let's just say there were two million people. And I, I, I heard that number thrown around by commentators. Check this out. If 10 loose lips sunk the ship for two million people, that's one loose lip for every 200,000, right? If you divide it all the way down, it would only take one five thousandth of just one of us given over to a bad report in order to affect 40 people. So if just the minutest fraction of you is given over to a bad report, you could sink the ship for 40 people or affect 40 people. Now, I'm kind of being funny here, you know. I mean, I don't know, how can one five thousandths of us be given over to? But you see what I'm saying? We need to keep in mind that just one little word of negativity can lead to discouragement, can lead to unnecessary despair, can, can, can even turn a group of people. Look at what it says in the beginning of verse, or chapter 14 when these ten, 10 individuals began to spout off at the mouth. It says, Numbers 14.1, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. Ten guys brought this on. The whole congregation despond in verse 2, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Don't speak those words. Don't speak those words. Why? Because they got what they spoke. They literally died in the wilderness. They spoke it into existence. You know, I mean, you yeah. know. They spoke those words and they got what they spoke, is what I'm saying. You know, this is not an easy region to be in. Right? Madison is not presently the most Christian-friendly city in the world. Right? But if we go, to, go around saying, oh man, it's so tough here. We're never going to see any fruit. I'm just so tired. Be careful what you say. 
Now, there's times when, you know, we need to rest. I'm not saying, you know, I'm tired today, I need to rest. I'm not saying that. But I mean, it's, it's a mindset, right? That, that if, if, if we're facing resistance, how are we coming through that? Speak life. Declare the promises of God. I mean, if God's given you some promises to impact the city in some way, shape, or form, God's going to supply. He's going to do it. All we got to do is take that step of faith when we're at our own Kadesh Barnea. Amen? You know, it's always easier to believe a negative statement than a positive one. So that's why we got to get around the positive ones. Here, here are two guys saying, we can do it. Joshua and Caleb. And God said we can do it. And ten guys saying we can't do it. We need to be careful when we speak a word of discouragement because our words carry weight. They influence things like yeast influences bread. It just grows. It can go through a congregation or it can go through someone's heart. You know, there's been times I've been excited about something God's put in my heart and I've shared it with someone else and, and then I left away feeling discouraged because... They, what they share, and it went into my heart. Oh, let's not be about those kind of people. You know, Dr. Dobbins says it takes 40 positive words to counteract just one negative word to a child. Think about that. We need to be careful and keep in mind that just a little word of discouragement can lead to unnecessary disappointment and despair. Can you imagine a million and a half people sitting there crying all night? And God's sitting up there saying, I can't believe this. I told them I was going to give it to them. What? what? What's happening here? Don't they remember what I did in Egypt? Don't they remember the Red Sea? Don't they remember the waters of Mara? Don't they remember the rock of Horeb? When Moses struck the rock and I fed them, gave them water? Don't they remember Mount Sinai? Don't they remember the cloud and the fire? Point number five. We need to keep in mind that external... And internal circumstances do not alter or negate God and his promises. External and internal circumstances don't alter God's plan. They don't affect him. My wife and I were given a promise. It's been confirmed several times. But there's an internal circumstance that looks like it's in the way. Well, let me tell you, that internal circumstance does not negate God and his promise and his ability to do what he said he's going to do. Amen? And so I have a choice. I can look at that internal circumstance and I can start to speak negatively and have my destiny and promise thwarted or go around Mount Sinai for seven more years until God brings me back to it. Or I can look at God and his ability to move any external or internal circumstance. Right. Amen? Amen. That's what That's we're right. talking Amen. about. He's already looked at the situation and has said, I'm going to do this. So the situation isn't going to alter what he said he's going to do. He wouldn't have said that if he was going to do it. If he wasn't going to do it. If the circumstances weren't there to get it done. These folks were letting external circumstances like giants and fortified cities say it can't be done. But God knew about it all along, and he said it, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to make a way. Number six. So we need to decide whose report we're going to believe. Whose report are you going to believe? Because, you know, on any given situation, you will get differing reports. Trust me, I know. My leadership style is that of a collaborator. All right. You know, when I'm making a decision, I naturally try to gather all the data I can, you know, and, 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 and all the input I can from all the people that I can before I make a decision. And, you know, that's one leadership style, other leadership styles. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but that's my leadership style, right? And I usually get several different reports when I do that. Maybe in the millennium it will be different, but right now, sad to say, you may get a bad report. You may give a bad report. Are you going to believe your own report? Or are you going to believe the majority report? Or are we going to believe God's report? We need to remember that loose lips sink ships. 
They sink dreams. They sink hopes. They torpedo faith like a depth. They're like a depth charge to our happiness. So let me wrap it up here. I realize that we live in a world that isn't completely brought under the do dominion and, 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 uh, of, of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It's in the process. It's not totally there yet. It's going to be total and complete when Jesus returns, right? And we live in a world that's full of curses. I realize that everything isn't perfect. I realize that uh, there, there is sickness, there's pain, there's injustice all around us. I realize there's circumstances that are out of our control. I realize that the bad things can happen to good people and good things can happen to bad people. And I realize that sometimes things don't make rhyme or reason. But can I give you a good report today? I want us to end on a good report. I want to leave our focus on a good report. So I'm going to just refer to a few scriptures that help us focus on our good report. John 16.33 says this, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have frustration. No. In me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. What? I have overcome the world. That is a truth that God has given us. Just as much as in Numbers where he told the Israelites, go in and take the land that I'm going to give you. We need to believe that and integrate it into our lives. Amen? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. rest. More toil? No. Rest. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. I mean, we give him our junk and he gives him us our, his peace and his presence and his rest and his healing and his joy. You know, we sometimes interpret that that scripture like we fish, right? You know, cast all your cares. We take our care pole, you know, and, and we have our care hook, and, and we, we attach the care to our care hook and our care pole, and we look out and we say, oh, God must be over there. So, so we cast our care over to God, you know, and then we wait a little bit, and we reel it back in, and we look at it, and it's still there, and then, oh, okay. And then we, we look over here, we cast our care over here, and, and we we try to tantalize God with our care, you know, and we reel it back in, we look at it, we focus at it again. That's not what the word cast means. See, the Greek word for cast means to cast it away, never expecting to see it again. There's no strings attached. It's gone, cast, let loose, thrown away. Give it to him because he cares for you. That's a promise. And we could go on and on and on. There's so many scriptures, scriptures full of promises that you and I can get into our hearts. It's good to memorize these things. Scripture says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Man, man, they were called according to his purpose. And they stood there at Kadesh Barnea and they were right where they were supposed to be. Amen? One more step and they would have had it. But ten guys, they ended up, they ended up going one year for every 40 days that they spent in that promised land. A year of funerals and death and drudgery and they could have been in there eating grapes and pomegranates and watching the Packers, I mean the Giants go down. <laughs> Loose lips. I'm a New England Patriot fan. Sorry, I had to get that in there. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> Loose lips sink ships. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to ex do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. One last scripture, and I close with this. Numbers 23.19. Right, our passage of scripture was in Numbers, right? Well, we're going to scoot ahead to verse 23.19. God says, God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Question mark. Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? He's going to make it good. He's going to do it. Remember, loose lips sink ships. If God has spoken to you, 
Don't let anyone sink your ship. You step out and you focus on the promises of God. Find your own promises. I just mentioned five or six there. There's a lot more that we can stand upon and meditate upon. Now you kind of understand why this is an important message for us to hear at different times and encourage us. Amen. And you know, there are times when churches are brought by God to their own Kadesh Barneas. And when that happens, let's not entertain those bad reports, right? Let's support our leadership and let's speak the positive things because that's what's going to help you individually and you corporately as a church move into the blessings and the promises that God has given you. Amen? Well, uh, maybe, Tina, could you, um, Colin, maybe begin to play soft, please? <clears throat> I wasn't sure how to end this, this message, but I would be remiss in and not giving you an opportunity to respond if you feel you need to. So as Tina plays quietly, if you need to find a place at this altar to maybe do some repenting, I encourage you to do it. Let God know you're serious. And it sometimes requires us to take a step of faith. So I'd like you all to stand with me. If you, if the Holy Spirit has, has touched your heart and you've said, you know, Wow, it's brought up brought your your mind some some things maybe that you've spoken that have been negative over your over the promises he's given you. Hey, let God know you're serious. Come forward, we'll pray with you. Come forward, say, God, I'm sorry. I don't want to speak negatively over my situation. I don't want to speak negatively over someone else. I don't want my lips to be loose. I don't want to sink anyone's hopes or dreams. I don't want to seek my own promises. I want to see them come to pass. Make a turn today. If that's you, I'm giving you this opportunity to come forward and just say, God, help me. If that's not you, oh, that's good. Let this message be an encouragement to you to keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing.